Good evening, I'm Jack Fuji, and welcome to the 16th and last session of Agriculture 194R, Focus on Agriculture for the Spring 1999 semester. Focus on Agriculture, as most of you know, is a one credit course offered by the College of Agriculture at the University of Hawaii Hilo, or I should say College of Agriculture, Forestry and Natural Resource Management. And we come to you live every Thursday evening, but this is our last Thursday evening for the semester from the television studios located in the Mo'okini Library here on the University of Hawaii at Hilo campus. We hope that you stay tuned with us this evening. We have another very interesting presentation. Tonight we're gonna talk about uh, the biological overview of Hawaii's native resources. So we hope that you'll stay tuned. And uh, as most of you know, this semester we're, we've been covering the natural resources and conservation biology of our, our native resources here in Hawaii. And uh, this is our last semester, our, or our last uh, uh, lecture for this semester. So if I could have the ELMO, I'd just like to inform you that uh, I would like to have all of your lecture notes in my office by next Thursday, May 13th. So please get your lecture notes in by May 13th. Also, I'd like to remind you that next uh, uh, fall semester, we'll be doing a cooking class again. So we hope that uh, uh, you'll sign up for the class. And uh, if you'd like to know how to sign up for the class, uh, let me put my address here for you. Uh, if you'd like to sign up for the class, let us know. Uh, write to me at the College of Agriculture, Forestry, and Natural Resource Management, University of Hawaii at Hilo, 200 West Kaweli Street, Hilo, Hawaii, 96720-4091. Also, I'd like to mention that uh, uh, we sent out uh, evaluation form to all of you who are taking the course via television. Uh, I hope that you will uh, complete the evaluation forms and send them in. Uh, it's a way of uh, how we can uh, improve the class, and if you have any suggestions of any kind, just jot them down and uh, send in your evaluation forms with your lecture notes. Since we are coming to you live this evening at approximately 8 p.m., those of you in the viewing audience and, of course, those of you here in the studio can write in and ask questions of our, uh, or not ask, que well, ask questions of our uh, guest speakers. And uh, we hope that uh, you will call us, those of you on the outer islands of uh, Maui, Oahu, Kauai, Molokai, and Lanai, who are on cable uh, connection, uh, you can call us collect. And of course, those of you on the big island can call us uh, direct. And as I indicated to you earlier this evening, we're gonna be talking about the, uh, well, we'll have a biological overview of uh, uh, Hawaii's native resources. My guest speaker this evening is Dr. Stephen Miller. Uh, Dr. Miller is with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. He's the program uh, coordinator for the Ecosystem Conservation Program. Uh, Dr. Miller received his Ph.D. in zoology from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And he's been in this uh, conservation ecology area in the state of Hawaii for the past 19 years, so he has a lot of experience, and he's been with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for the last six, uh, uh, six years, so uh, Steve brings with him a lot of uh, information on uh, our native resources, so at this time, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you uh, Dr. Miller, so Steve, why don't you come on over and take over the class? Thank you. Well, to, in, in the next hour, I want to try and present to all of you a review of the, the, the state of the, of the native resources that we find here in the Hawaiian Islands when we take a look at, uh, at, at what's out there. Um, I'm going to sort of approach this from the perspective of, of Hawaii's ecosystems and, and what, those, what those ecosystems um, contain. Um, in doing so, I'm going to talk about sort of three major areas of, of, of uh, ecosystem management. Um, those three areas that you have to look at when you look at ecosystems are the first is scale. You have to get a sense 
of the, uh, of the scale, the geographic areas, the landscapes that are required in order to begin to manage native ecosystems. Um, another aspect of, of managing native ecosystems that you need to be concerned about, of course, is diversity, the, the range and depth and diversity of plants and animals that live in these ecosystems. And when managing, you have to adjust your management to embrace the, the, the largest number of uh, plants and animals that you can hope to cover in a given landscape. And the third aspect of, of ecosystem management, which I'm really not going to discuss much tonight, has to do with process. And of course, those are the processes that allow ecosystems to function. And those would include things like pollination or competition among animals, competition among plants. Predation is another example of a good process. The dispersal of individuals or, or seeds or propagules throughout the ecosystem in order to maintain healthy and viable populations is another process. And of course, things like nutrient cycling, the, the breakdown of food products and, and how those products get recycled back into the ecosystem. So obviously, process is a, is a big and complex issue. And, and um, we're not going to have time to really begin to address those processes. So we'll focus mainly then on, the, on questions of scale and questions of diversity. And I'm going to start off with diversity and sort of go through a, a quick series of uh, slides and discussion to give you a feel for the, for the uh, biological diversity that we have here in the Hawaiian Islands. Um, I think I'll start off with the first slide, please. This slide is um, an overview of, uh, and it's a satellite image of the Hawaiian Islands. And you can see that uh, the, the islands are basically aligned in a chain with a windward and a leeward side. And, uh, and th this particular alignment has resulted from volcanic activity that has formed the islands. And they sit on a tectonic plate then that moves along, creating a chain of islands. And the windward, leeward side, of course, is related to the position of the islands on the globe. The trade winds impact the windward side and create a very moist condition there. As the, as the, as the trade winds move across the islands, they become drier. And so the leeward sides of the islands tend to, tend to be a good deal drier. And this, of course, creates quite a diversity of habitats from, from uh, windward to leeward, especially when you consider we have high islands here in Hawaii that reach quite high elevations. And so you have a, a, a very large elevation gradient as well that creates even greater diversity, habitat diversity. Um, this shot is of the big island. And I just wanted to use it to emphasize these sort of uh, windward, leeward trends that you see here. Um, again, from the upper right is the trade winds impact the islands. and. Uh, and create quite a bit of precipitation and rainfall. And, uh, and then, of course, on the, as they pass over Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa, much of that rainfall is lost. And the central part of the island is, it tends to be rather dry. And uh, of course, the leeward side on, off to the left is, uh, is, is a much drier coastline as well. So we get, uh, again, quite a range of, of weather conditions and geological conditions that lead us to uh, to a, a, a diversity of habitat types. Um, <clears throat> the geology of the Hawaiians, Hawaiian Islands, of course, is of volcanic origin. This is a photograph of Pu'u O'o taken at night um, here on the Big Island. And you can see that it can become quite active and, uh, and produce quite, uh, quite dramatic uh, volcanic displays. Um, the lava flows, of course, are the basis of the Hawaiian Islands. This is a lava tube system that can transport lava quite long distances down to form whole new coastlines. And uh, it doesn't just have to occur as terrestrial flows, although terrestrial flows are very common. And in this shot, um, this is again on the Big Island showing the uh, large areas that can be covered by lava flow systems and leaving little, little patches of forest called kipukas isolated within the lava flows. And these kipukas can serve as I points of isolation for populations of animals and can, in fact, encourage diversification of the, of the plants and animals that we see here in the Hawaiian Islands. Um, <clears throat> 
the weather, of course, again, is a, is a major issue. And here, again, is a, a different shot of the Big Island showing windward and, and, and leeward, leeward areas. Um, I think I'm going to go over to the overheads now and, uh, and let you uh, sort of focus on those. These, um, this shot is just a, a sort of a mapped projection then of, uh, of the Pacific Basin as a whole. And what I want, to, want, to, want you to notice here is that all of these red circles, including Hawaii, represent volcanic hotspots that occur throughout the Pacific Basin. These are very similar geologically to the Hawaiian Islands. They're, it's a volcanically active area that continues to put lava up off, off of the seafloor and build them into, into undersea mountains or eventually into islands. And, and, uh, and you can see there's quite an assemblage of them. This is a major process of island formation throughout the Pacific, but it also occurs on mainland areas like you see in Australia, as well as Yellowstone National Park, perhaps one of the most famous hot spots in, in the United States. It's essentially just like the Hawaiian Islands. It's a very volcanically active area that that puts out large amounts of, uh, of lava flows and geologic activity. In, in Yellowstone, it's expressed as hot springs mainly because there's such a large land mass over, sit, over overlying the hot spot. Whereas in the Hawaiian Islands, of course, we get a very distinctive chain of islands that form. Um, in doing so, with these, this volcanic activity as well as the climatic and geological conditions in which the islands occur, you get a tremendous diversity of, of, of native ecosystems. Um, the terrestrial ecosystems we have here occur as, as dry, mesic, and wet plant communities. And these, of course, support a whole distinctive arrays of, of, of birds and s plants as well as uh, a variety of, of invertebrates. You can see that there's at least 25 different types of coastal communities in the Hawaiian Islands. 20 montane types of communities, 52 low elevation communities, as well as about eight subalpine and, and of course only one alpine community, those being the highest elevations on Mauna, Ka Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa. Um, we also have things like lava fields and crater communities that form here because of the, the great deal, uh, great amount of volcanic activity. And of course, also associated with volcanoes are, are lava tube communities that form. As the lava tubes that drain the uh, molten lava out toward the sea, they eventually empty out and cool off and they form these very large passages. And within those passages is a, is a whole assemblage of native, native arthropods that live there um, and are found only within those lava tube systems. Of course, there are freshwater communities here in the Hawaiian Islands, streams, bogs, and wetlands that pretty much all of us are familiar with. And there's these very unique ankyline pool communities. Again, these are most commonly occur on the Big Island and on Maui, uh, but uh, they, there are a few occur on some of the other islands as well. But they, they represent very unique communities um, co associated with the coastal coastlines of these islands. And, uh, represent a very unique aspect of, of Hawaiian terrestrial communities. Of course, Hawaii is not just terrestrial. There's also a, a variety of marine communities that occur in the Hawaiian Islands. And each of these communities similarly supports very unique assemblages of fishes and algae and coral and, and other invertebrates. Things like shore communities and tidal communities. Um, the reef communities, which we're most, the most familiar with and think about when we think of the, of the marine communities, but also subtitle rubble and sand communities that occur that, are, that, that support interesting assemblages. And of course, the pelagic fish community, another very popular community that many, many people in Hawaii uh, are aware of. And, and then, of course, bays, lagoons, and estuaries, but also submarine caves that, uh, that often are extensions of the lava tube system caves that emerge underwater and form, uh, event form eventually form these significant submarine caves that house whole assemblages of plants and animals. <clears throat> Before I go on, I think I'm going to go back to the slides and just give you sort of a quick overview of some of the plants and animals that uh, occur in the Hawaiian Islands. Um, this, of course, is the top of Mauna Kea. It rep it's a 
one of the really unique habitats in Hawaii, and I want to give you a sort of go through some of these ecosystem types that occur so you can get a feel for the tremendous diversity that they represent. It's a very barren, snow covered in the winter, um, you know, exposed rock in the, in, the, in, the, in the summer seasons, quite a unique habitat for a, for a tropical setting, um, and uh, of course can be very, very cold up there. <laughs> Um, the most diverse and rich habitats in the Hawaiian Islands, of course, are the wet forests. This particular photo is from Molokai, and, uh, and these forests um, can be quite diverse and, and very, uh, very rich in, in biota. In contrast, you get dry forest areas. This happens to be on the big island at Pu'uva'ava'a. Um, and, and they, of course, have quite different structures to them, quite a different assemblages of plants. And in fact, these dry forest music and dry forest, music meaning sort of wet, but not real wet, like a wet forest, but not dry. So it's sort of in between dry and wet. And those music forest settings were, in fact, some of the most diverse settings in the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, there's, there's wetland areas. This is on Oahu, um, Heiea Marsh. And, of course, up in the mountains, you get little bog settings like this. Uh, this, again, is on Oahu, but there's some very, very elaborate bogs on Molokai and Kauai, uh, extensive bog systems with whole assemblages of plants and, and invertebrates that uh, tend to be associated only with those bog systems. Of course, there's stream systems that occur throughout the Hawaiian Islands and, uh, and probably are elaborated, they're greatest on Kauai, which is, of course is the oldest of the main islands and has an extensive system of streams as we'll see later on. <clears throat> and this is a photo of one of the lava tubes here on the Big Island. And you can see these lava tubes can be extremely large tube systems. Um, and uh, and the, the, uh, you can see the root systems that hang down inside from the plants that grow above the lava tubes those trees will send their root systems down into the tubes themselves and the arthropods then that live in the tubes derive their essential nutrition from these root systems um, and, uh, and there's a whole community of arthropods that will feed on the root systems and then there's another set of arthropods that will prey on those arthropods and uh, so you build a, a, again a, a hierarchy, a, a food chain within these lava tube systems that allow them to, sit, to, to sustain themselves. Again. The tube systems depend on the plants that grow above the tube systems, and it's um, some of the native birds. This is the akohe kohe on Maui, the crested honeycreeper. Um, again, a pretty rare, rare bird. Um, feeds on ohia blossoms. Um, this is the alala -la here on the Big Island, the Hawaiian crow, very rare bird that uh, a great deal of effort and work is going in to try and save this bird and bring it back from the brink of extinction involving the Peregrine Fund and the Fish and Wildlife Resources over on the Kona Coast. <coughs> um, this is Elapayo. This is probably the most recent addition to, uh, to the endangered list of Hawaiian birds, the Oahu population of the Alapayo is uh, in the process of being added to the endangered species list because its numbers over the years have declined so drastically. <clears throat> it's a wonderful little bird, very, uh, very vocal and very, uh, comes right up to you and sings its song up in the forest. The Iivi, um, again, another beautiful native Hawaiian bird, um, seems to be on the decline. Ornithologists in the state are a bit concerned about this particular bird species. Uh, there's lots of native Hawaiian snails, of course, and uh, this is some, some of them are very small. This is in a little tiny auriculella, maybe at, at the best a quarter of an inch long. Um, a little bigger and a little more diverse, things like succinia that, uh, again, occur, tend to occur in the wet forest areas. Uh, the native tree snails, uh, perhaps uh, some of the biggest and best studied of the snails. Uh, this is an Acatinella on the island of Oahu, and these things come in a a very diverse array of colors and patterns. This is uh, another one from Oahu, and, uh, and finally two more. Some of these are really quite spectacular and were collected extensively because of the beautiful shell patterns that they represented. And it's only been within the past decade or so that we've really begun to understand the actual biology of these animals. <clears throat> 
lots and lots of native arthropods. Of course, the arthropods in, in Hawaii are the most diverse group of animals that, uh, that occur in the islands. This is a Kamehameha butterfly. <clears throat> this is a big Manduka sphinx moth, native sphinx moth. <clears throat> Um, lots of damselflies that occur throughout the Hawaiian Islands, quite beautiful in, in flight. And of course, uh, this is the koa bug, uh, again, one of our natives that's not doing too well. It's having problems because of, uh, of introduced parasitoids that uh, will infect its eggs and, uh, and prevent it from successfully reproducing. But again, a beautiful emerald green color on these animals. Uh, lots of native spiders in Hawaii that occur here. Um, sometimes we don't think about spiders too much, but uh, there's quite a, an amazing array of spiders that have diversified throughout the Hawaiian Islands and represent some really unique forms and uh, really unique ways of making a living in the forests. <coughs> um, again, even as high on the top of Mauna Kea, you get bugs like the wikiu bug um, that occur up there. This, this bug relies on dead insects that are blown up onto the mountains of Mauna Kea and it will crawl around and, and feed off of these dead insects there and uh, it's ad adapted to that very cold situation that occurs up at 13,000 feet on the top of that mountain and, and, and you tend to think of Hawaii as a wonderful warm sunny place and yet there are plants and animals in Hawaii that require fairly cold and cool conditions in order to survive and this is, this is one of those organisms. And of course, again, within the caves, the cave communities, this is a blind cave cricket. Often within these lava tubes, you f when you find arthropods, they are sightless. They have lost the ability to see. And this, this in cave cricket is an example of that, but it also applies to large wolf spiders that live in these cave systems that are completely blind and, uh, and a variety of other cave organisms. There's lots of plants in Hawaii, and uh, there's been pre previous talks on plants, so I'm not going to spend too much on time. The uh, Ohia lehua, of course, is one of the dominant ones that provides a great deal of structure to the Hawaiian forest, but also a great deal of food to Hawaiian arthropods and birds, as well as snails that all live on, the, on, this, on this wonderful plant. Um, things like kokia that are just absolutely spectacular and again a, a, a rare and endangered plant here in Hawaii, a dryland forest tree that produced this magnificent blossom and unfortunately it's it was pollinated by a bird and that bird is extinct and so this plant consequently has no pollinator anymore and its populations have been declining and declining and it's in pretty bad shape. <clears throat> There's native things like native mints that are <clears throat> quite unique. <clears throat> Native begonias, these are things you tend to think of in mainland ter terms, lots of begonias and mints, but in fact we have our own unique species here in the Hawaiian Islands. And uh, of course our own native geraniums, it's quite beautiful plants that, uh, that uh, are very unique. And of course things that are just absolutely spectacular found nowhere else on earth, things like uh, the, the, the silver swords that occur here. <clears throat> The marine communities, of course, are not quite as unique, but very robust and diverse. Um, lots of large coral communities that occur here in Hawaii, extensive reef flat systems that occur throughout the Pacific. This happens to be in, in, in Rose Atoll down in, in, uh, in the vicinity of American Samoa. Um, but uh, you can get similar sorts of uh, atoll systems up in the northwest Hawaiian islands that are just beautiful and extremely rich and abundant. And, and and also, of course, the marine system is composed of lagoon systems. This one ha is on the island of Tutuila in American Samoa. But uh, again, these large lagoon systems uh, have to typically have occurred in the Hawaiian Islands. Um, lots of seabirds, uh, red-tailed tropic birds, um, things like boobies that occur extensively throughout the, the Hawaiian chain. Um, fairy terns and, and a variety of other kinds of terns. Um, again, major fish communities that occur throughout here, open water species as well as, uh, as, as large assemblages of reef species. Uh, the diversity is just truly astounding. And of course, the marine community houses a whole array of invertebrates. Again, again the invertebrate communities tend to be the most diverse and, and abundant uh, in the marine system as well as on the terrestrial system. This is a crown of thorns starfish here. 
And this happens to be a giant clam. Again, this one is from down in American, down on, the, on Rose Atoll near American Samoa, but uh, lots of large clams that still occur down in there. And of course, this is a, a, a nudibranch. There's a great diversity of marine nudibranchs that occur. These are sort of the equivalent of, uh, of slugs and terrestrial slugs, only terrestrial slugs we don't have much affection for. But in the marine community, nudibranchs have taken on a beautiful array of colors and diversity that uh, is quite, quite unique and astounding. Of course, there's the sea, you know, things like sea turtles that we see here in the Hawaiian Islands, and of course, last but not least, uh, things like humpback whales that uh, tend to really catch the interest of, of, of the public. Well, having sort of gone through that uh, assemblage of diversity, um, and you can get a sense of uh, the incredible array of things that have, that have managed to uh, grow and survive here in the Hawaiian Islands. And, And just as a sort of a summary of, the, of that, I want to talk a bit about endemism in the Hawaiian Islands. So I'm going to go back to the, uh, to the overheads. And this table here shows um, the endemism in the, of species that occur in Hawaii. Now, endemism means that those animals are found only in the Hawaiian Islands. They're not found anywhere else on Earth. They are completely unique to Hawaii. And you can see the terrestrial biota, the plants and animals that live on the lands here in Hawaii, 96% of them are found only in Hawaii. You can't find these organisms anywhere else throughout the Pacific, no matter where you go. Interestingly enough, 74% of those are found only on a single island. So most of what you see in Hawaii is unique to the island that you live on. Um, they are found only on the Big Island, or they're found only on Kauai, or only on Oahu, wherever island you go to, the vast majority, almost three quarters of those plants and animals that are native to those islands will be unique to that island. This is very important in terms of thinking about conservation of native biodiversity, because it's, you can't simply protect a part of one island for the native biota and say, okay, that's good for all the islands, because the plants and animals change from island to island. Again, just breaking it down for, into birds, snails, plants, and arthropods. You can see arthropods are the, by far and away the most abundant thing here. Um, birds that we tend to focus on the most actually represent the smallest number of species in the Hawaiian Islands. But in all cases, these are all highly endemic to the Hawaiian Islands, and in all cases, very, very, uh, very, very much limited to single islands in the Hawaiian Islands. If you look at the marine biota, of course, it's, it's a bit different. Again, it's very diverse, has lots and lots of species composed of it, but not too much of it is endemic to the Hawaiian Islands. And, and that's because marine organisms can move quite easily through the water. They produce, often produce very small um, dispersal stages that can drift very long distances, and so consequently they're not just limited to the Hawaiian Islands. You can find the same species in, in places like American Samoa or Johnston Atoll or, or other, more, other more distant locations. And of course, none of them are single island endemics. You can f what you find on the big island in terms of the marine, marine organisms, chances are you'll find the same thing on, on, on other islands throughout the Hawaiian chain. So it's a, it's a good deal. This is probably one of the major differences between the marine biota and the terrestrial biota in the Hawaiian Islands. Of course, all of this diversity is really nice, but it doesn't mean that everything's really great, of course. In fact, we have lots of threats to, uh, to the Hawaiian Islands. Um, the major threats to the marine communities, of course, are things like the impacts to fish, you know, fisheries impacts, where you get overfishing taking place, or, or incidental bycatch. So when a fishering, fisherman goes out, he's after a certain species, but he'll get other things as well in, in, in the catch, and those things then are often just discarded because they're of no economic interest. But in fact, they may, may represent ecologically important species, and so you can begin to, you, you have to be sensitive to those ecological situations when, the, when, you, when you pursue these things um, commercial, at a commercial level. Abandoning fish gear, of course, this is you know, a, a bad thing for things like seals and turtles and birds. They can get entangled in these, and it creates problems and in some parts of uh, the Pacific you get you know bleach and explosives are used to uh, you know as, as a way to collect fish really quickly and simply and they actually 
kill everything else and really, really are, are, are a great harm to the reef communities. Alien species, of course, are, are, are a big problem. Um, reef siltation that can bury reefs. If you go to Molokai, you'll see a, 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 an example of this that is, that is extensive where the reef systems off of Molokai have been smothered by siltation. And of course, those are called by, caused, unfortunately, by the ungulates, the goats, mainly the goats and sheep that occur in the uplands areas where they uh, degrade the forest cover to the point that the, the, the land surface begins to erode and washes down into these reef systems and, and silts them up. Um, there's native communities, of course, can be displaced by alien organisms. Um, these can get here through intentional introductions in some cases, but often they can arrive accidentally in ballast water of, sh of ships or as, as fouling on the hulls of ships. So um, those are issues that uh, we have to be sensitive to when we start talking about expanding our uh, you know, importations and, and, and transportation mechanisms. Of course, there are all, all kinds of, uh, you know, a number of marine disease organisms as well that, that can kill off coral reefs and, you know, sea urchins as well as fish. Contaminants and debris is, is the third major category here in which that can alter, the, again, the marine communities and uh, can result in long-term and slow degradation of, of marine systems, often to the point that it may take decades for us, for you to really start to notice that things aren't quite what they used to be. And, uh, and those, those things are, are issues that re really need to be, have to be very sensitive to because, because of the long time lag that can occur in, uh, in noticing them. Physical alterations to habitat, when, you know, mainly from things like ship groundings and dredgings can occur as well as injury and death to sea turtles from things thrown overboard off of, that fall overboard off of shipping. Uh, the terrestrial community, of course, has its whole set of threats that, uh, again, are, are the result, mostly the result of human activities and therefore our responsibilities. Disruption of native habitats and community processes, of course, where alien species are the main culprit here and come in and tend to either displace native species or actually prey on native species. Um, and, uh, and create problems. Again, alien ungulates can, can erode native habitats. Cause, you know, these are the, you know, things like pigs and goats that tend, tend to degrade native habitats. The plants and animals of Hawaii are, are not used to, to dealing with the kinds of impacts that, uh, that pigs and sheep and goats and deer can, can bring to the lands because over the evolutionary history of those plants and animals, they've never really had to cope with those sorts of disturbances, so they're not, you, not adapted to dealing with those sort of disturbances. And consequently, these, these aliens can have a, a big impact on it. Herbivory and, and predation, again, by alien species, um, for the native birds in Hawaii uh, that, that, that occur not just in Hawaii but the Pacific, um, brown tree snake is a big problem in places like Guam where the snake has come in and, and uh, pretty much eliminated most of the native birds on the island of Guam. It's a big concern about it getting here to Hawaii. Cats and dogs, of course, can, can wreak havoc with native bird populations as well as uh, the introduced mongoose. <clears throat> For plants, again, we've got pigs and goats, sheep, things that eat plants, uh, including slugs and insects you know, that, uh, that can be problems for the, for the native plant fauna. For the native snail faunas, again, uh, things like rats, um, introduced alien snails that prey on these native snails, as well as, uh, <clears throat> as, well as alien flatworms that have been come in. These are large terrestrial flatworms that also can um, prey on the native uh, snail populations. And of course, native insects get, uh, get uh, affected by a whole, again, a whole variety of things, including other insects that are brought in for a variety of purposes uh, for bio as biocontrol agents. Competition among native, alien and native species for limited resources. Um, these things, again, can occur. Probably the best example is for, for pollen and, and nectar, you know, where, where native alien species come in and, and, and utilize those pollen and nectar sources and make them less available to the native species. And of course, disease and, and parasitism, native birds, probably 
the greatest impact on Hawaii's native birds it has to do with avian malaria, which arrived with uh, introduced birds and avian pox. Both of those actually came on with introduced birds. And the native birds just uh, don't have, a min have a, much of an immunity to those diseases and they suffer um, the consequences. And it's been probably one of the, the major causes of the decline in native bird populations. <clears throat> Again, native insects and native snails uh, suffer from introduced parasitoid wasps as, as well as parasitoid flies that will lay eggs, lay, um, lay eggs within the eggs of these, of these uh, native insects and snails and prevent them from continuing to develop. So we have a whole series of problems <clears throat> that uh, really have led to Hawaii being what has become known as the endangered species capital of the world. And uh, it's a, it's a, it really is a big problem. Hawaii represents less than one-tenth of one percent of the land area of the United States. It's a very, very small amount of land areas. There's only three other states in the Union that are smaller than Hawaii, Connecticut, Delaware, and Rhode Island. <clears throat> and yet the Hawaiian Islands has over 30 percent of all of the endangered plants and animals that occur in the United States. Again, this is the tremendous diversity that occurs out here in the Hawaiian Islands because of its unique setting and because, of the, because it's an island ecosystem, the plants and animals aren't used to dealing with a lot of the kinds of impacts that, that we have, as humans have brought to the islands and consequently um, these plants and animals have, have suffered from that. Um, we have about 350 endangered species here in Hawaii, 14 that are threatened. Talking about 17 additional species that are probably being, that are being proposed to be added to the endangered species list, and 81 species that are candidates. Those are things that we know probably should be listed, but we just haven't gotten around yet. The Fish and Wildlife Service hasn't gotten around yet to actually doing the, going through the administrative process of adding them onto the list. Our nearest competitor, of course, is California, a much, much bigger state than Hawaii, as you can imagine. And uh, as you can see, it has far fewer endangered species and uh, has more threatened species than Hawaii, but that's because when things go in Hawaii, they become endangered and not threatened, which is sort of a lower level of endangerment. And of course, uh, 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 fewer, uh, you know, proposed and fewer number of candidate species. Again, California has about 20% of the uh, endangered species in the United States. So between these two states, we represent literally half of the endangered species that occur in the United States. And, and as I say, most of those, even of those, occur out here in the Hawaiian Islands. <clears throat> as I had talked about endemism, I had made the point that Hawaii's species are unique to the Hawaiian Islands and often unique to a single island and the same applies to the endangered species that we have here in Hawaii. Um, out of the 400 and some odd listed and candidate species here in Hawaii, 80 percent of those are single island endemics. They're only found on one island so when a species becomes endangered it's unique to your island wherever you happen to be. Um, there's this category called species of concern and these are things that uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service sort of keeps a list of and when biologists come in and tell us, gee, you know, I think this pot, this species may be declining in numbers or abundance, you know, we used to see it a lot. We don't see it so much anymore. It goes on this list of species of concern and, uh, and of course, to date, there are over a thousand species in the Hawaiian Islands that, uh, that biologists out there feel are probably in some state of decline and, uh, and you know, need to be um, more carefully looked at. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to talk very briefly about endangered species, uh, about uh, alien species and the kinds of threats that can come about. I want to just, for the sake of, of a brief discussion, focus on myconia. And this is uh, a, 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 a forest tree that has been introduced into Hawaii and uh, it and it represents a really major threat. It has extremely large leaves. These leaves can be up to two feet long and, and, and maybe 10, 12 inches wide. They are, they're beautiful, beautiful dark green and the underside is this wonderful velvet, purple velvet. Uh, they're really quite spectacular actually. Um, but they form a very, very dense canopy and almost nothing can grow underneath them. And they, they got 
into the island of Tahiti and in, on that island they've taken over 60 to 70 percent of the native forests. Basically the 60 to percent of the 70 percent of the native forests in Tahiti is a monospecific stand of Myconia with n almost nothing growing underneath it. We're very concerned about a similar process taking place here in Hawaii. <coughs> this particular figure shows is a, is a projection of what might happen. Okay, this doesn't show what is, but what might be. So for each of these islands, each of the, these four islands, you can see I, I have outlined the range that Myconia could potentially expand into. And this is work done by, uh, by uh, some of the biologists up at Haleakala National Park. And within that range, I've added in the endangered species that occur within that area. So you, you can get a pretty good sense here, like on Kauai, for instance, that if Myconia were to get established well, it could occupy a very large area of the island and, in fact, have a major impact on the, on the, on the really rare plants and animals that occur on those islands. So there's a good deal of concern about it, and, and currently there's a good deal of effort going in to try and find these plants and eradicate them. So it's very important that, uh, that these sort of activities get pursued vigorously and as, the, as new ones come up that we continue to, uh, to pursue uh, those alien species as well. And this is a, a, an area that the Fish and Wildlife Service is trying to get into in a more significant way as time goes on. <clears throat> well, I want to sort of go into the islands now and begin to talk about landscape. We've sort of covered diversity, and you've gotten a sense of the diversity and a sense of the endangerment that, is a, that, that uh, has resulted to that diversity. And I want to begin then to now try to give you a landscape perspective of, of, of Hawaii and a feel for what, what's out there. I'm going to start with the island of Kauai and sort of work down the chain to the big island. Um, Kauai is the oldest of the main islands, and as you can see, it's, it has a lot of surface feature to it. It's highly eroded with lots of valleys and, and, uh, and wetland areas, extensive stream systems that occur in all of these valleys, um, a large um, swamp system, Alakai, that sits on top here. There's, a, again, a really unique assemblage of plants and animals that are associated with that swamp system. And when, here we go, let me start with this. Before people arrived on, on, in the Hawaiian Islands, of course, Kauai was a completely native island. Everything on it was native to Kauai, <laughs> native to Hawaii. And you can see there was an extensive wet forest system, the dark green here on the top. Um, next to that was the mesic forest system. This is the forest system that's not quite as wet as wet, but not dry. And then, of course, below that was the, was the dry forest system and, and with, uh, with shrubland areas along the coast. Very dynamic uh, distribution of plants and animals associated with this extensive system. And, of course, when people come in, they bring with them the things that they need to, that they want and or need to survive. And the current situation on Kauai looks dramatically different now. This is where we are today. 62% um, of the island, the part in gray here, represents the part of the island that is dominated by alien plants and animals. It's, if you go to those sections, you will be very hard pressed to find a native Hawaiian plant or animal in those areas. Um, Again, the upper wet forest on Kauai is still in pretty decent shape. It's, uh, it's still hanging on up there. It has some, some problems and difficulties, but it's okay. The, the uh, music forest, the lighter green, has been significantly impacted, and of course the low elevation dryland forest is almost entirely gone on the island. So um, you can see that these sorts of changes, the changes that have taken place over time and why biologists are, are pretty concerned about these areas that are left and, and what we wanted, what needs to be done to hang on to them. Um, the island of Oahu, of course, this is the most populated of the islands in Hawaii. Again, <coughs> um, a very well-developed stream system and, and, and highly sculpted mountains, um, good reef systems, and of course a large uh, a lagoon system associated with Pearl Harbor. <coughs> it similarly had extensive dry land forest areas as well as coastal um, and uh, you know dry shrub and grassland areas. 
an extensive music forest system that occurred throughout the middle of the island as well as around on the coast, and a very well-developed wet forest system and on the top of the Ko'olau Ridge, and, and as well as the small areas in the Waianais associated with uh, Mount Ka'ala. And of course, <coughs> Oahu is where the vast majority of the state's population live, and it's suffered a, the consequences of that. And as you can see, 83% of this island is now dominated by alien vegetation. If you want to see something native on Oahu, you have to go way, way up into the mountains. A hard day's hike in most cases. Um, and again, about all that's left is mostly the wet forest in the Ko'olau Range, which is the most inaccessible part of the island. Um, a little bit of, uh, of mesic forest um, remains in the, in the Waianais with a few patches of, uh, of, of dry, dry forest, but those are not in very good shape even so. <clears throat> For those of you living on Kauai, Kauai is a wonderful island, one of my favorite places. Um, the island sort of divided in half into a low section of the island and, in a, and a more mountainous section with well-developed stream systems. Um, those, those elevational gradients are reflected here. Um, prior to human occupation, Kauai was dominated by these uh, uh, very extensive low elevation shrubland and, and dryland forest system with a, with a good music forest and a good wetland forest system up in up on the top central part of the island. <clears throat> Currently today, 84% of the island is dominated by alien species. Again, about all that's left is these very high upper elevation reaches. Um, Kauai, or Molokai is the island that has the least amount of native forest remaining on it. Just barely, only by one, Oahu only beats it out by 1%. But you can see wherever we're getting these low elevation forest systems, which is where people live, of course, and where they carry out their activities, we're losing those components of the native ecosystem. <clears throat> for the Lanai, for Lanai residents, um, again, a, a pretty extensive low elevation area. Not too much elevation on Lanai, so there tends to be a fa fairly dry and not very many, it's not, no real good stream system developments and permanent stream systems that have developed there on the island. And this, of course, is reflected in what uh, would have occurred there prior to human occupation. Extensive dryland forests and low elevation shrubland, a, a good music forest and a small wetland forest sitting on the top of the highest part of the island. <clears throat> and today we have basically what uh, looks like this. Um, still some, uh, some, some dryland shrubland areas that occur on, 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 on the island with uh, very little music and almost no wet forest left in the middle. Again, 78% of the island is dominated by alien vegetation. <coughs> the island of Molokai, or Maui, two parts of the island, two distinct volcano systems that have developed at both uh, highly sculpted, excellent stream systems developed on the island. <coughs> Ex again, we got extensive low elevation forests and uh, wet and mesic forest systems. Maui, of course, begins to get into the in having subalpine and a little bit of alpine communities up on top of Haleakala um, because of the high elevation still associated with that volcano. <coughs> but the current situation, again, 70% of the island is dominated by alien species and again the, the, the wetland forests tend to be dominated. We have of course Haleakala National Park which sits on top of the mountain and so we still have some good subalpine and alpine communities that remain up there because of the, they've been protected for quite a long time and, uh, and there's active management going on to help maintain those. And here we arrive on the Big Island. The Big Island, of course, is the youngest of the islands. <clears throat> it's dominated by shield volcanoes that tend to be fairly smooth contoured, not a lot of deep canyons that have developed. The stream systems that do occur, the permanent stream systems, tend to be limited to uh, the windward side of uh, Mauna Kea and the Kohalas. Um, but they're quite good stream systems over in that part of the island. Um, the ground on most of these other areas that occur here in Hawaii ten, on the Big Island tend to be very porous because it's such a new island and the water just goes right into the ground and so it really doesn't have ta chance to establish a lot of well-defined stream, permanent stream systems. You'll see a lot of you know, stream channels around but often they spend most of the year dry until the heavy rains come. 
<coughs> and the Big Island, because it's the biggest island with the highest elevations, have extensive subalpine and alpine communities in the middle of the island. These are very dry areas, not much rainfall that gets up there. Um, an extensive wet forest community with a, a narrow band of music forest above that that occurred naturally. And, uh, and on the, on the windward si uh, leeward side of the island, some wet forest communities as well as uh, um, good music forest and, and, uh, and extensive dryland forest as well. Um, current situation, about 41% of the Big Island is dominated by alien species. Um, it's the lowest of all the islands, but keep in mind, most of the area on this upper elevation is pretty much dominated by lava flows <laughs> and very dry, ar arid conditions. And, uh, and so uh, it's, this sort of biases the percentage quite a bit because not much activity takes place up in those high elevation areas. Um, you can see that the, that the, a, a good deal of the wet forests and, uh, have been lost as well as the dry land coastal areas that uh, have sort of form a typical pattern of disturbance that we see here in the Hawaiian Islands. Well, with that in mind, the question sort of comes to, that we want to get to is where is Hawaii's biodiversity that's left? Where does this occur and how do we begin to work to defining where those areas are. And I'm sort of going to go through that with you on the Big Island. It, a similar process that you can do for all of the islands, but I'm going to start on the Big Island. And the way you do that, the way I've chosen to do that here, is to look at where the, the plant and animal resources occur. So this is a map that sort of shows the location of the, of the rare plants that occur in the Hawaii, in, on the Big Island. And these little dots represent locations of rare plant species. You can see they occur quite a, quite a ways around the island. Um, the red lines begin to encompass those dots to sort of say this is an important area for native Hawaiian plants. Um, the blue lines that you see here are areas that really haven't been surveyed well enough for us to know whether or not there's important Hawaiian plant species associated with those areas. So you can begin to start to, to get a sense of uh, the location of these plants. You know, they tend to start to fall into these wet and music forest areas, some, act, some, some concentrations up in the dry forest areas, as well as up in the Kohala Mountains. You can, if you continue on, you can take, do a similar thing and look at the, the, the Hawaiian forest birds. Where do, you, where do you find Hawaiian forest birds on the Big Island? Um, again, the dots represent locations of where forest birds have been seen. You, you tend to see these large clusters that, is, is, again, is, tend to be associated with these wet and music forest areas. Some high elevation areas like where, where palila occur up on Mauna Kea. Um, so you can begin to build a, another layer then of, of rare forest birds. Um, you can look at things like the coastal organisms that occur in Hawaii, the ankyline pool species that occur around the coast, as well as things like Hawaiian monk seal, where sightings have occurred for Hawaiian monk seals, um, where the best ankyline pool systems occur in, 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 on the Big Island. And, uh, you know, and, and again, where the perennial stream systems occur and which of those perennial streams are really in good shape and which of them are, tend to be more degraded. So, you know, and, and, and that sort of helps you begin to sort out where the, where the important resources are that remain in the Hawaiian Islands. Where do those, where do those actually occur? Um, additional things like Hawaiian hoary bat um, is another example. Of, uh, of again, the squares here represent locations of hoary bats. The, the area that in red here is, is important forest bird habitat, and you can see, sort of get a sense of whether or not important forest bird habitat does much for the Hawaiian hoary bat. And the bats tend to be scattered around quite a bit, so it really doesn't correlate very well with the location of Hawaiian hoary bats. Um, similar thing for, for water birds and seabirds. Here we have. Uh, a whole assemblage of, of, uh, of, of seabirds. Uh, a lot of these orange dots up here are, are nene. Um, 
the seabirds are their dark blue. You can begin to get a sense. Our seabird data is not very good, so it's, we really don't have a really good sense of where a lot of the Hawaiian seabirds actually nest on the islands. We know in some cases it's quite high at quite high elevations, and, it can, and they can nest all the way down through the native forests down to much lower elevations as well. Not what you typically think of when you think of seabirds. You tend to think of them on the beach or just up off the beach. But in fact, they use quite high elevation forest systems. Well, if you do that and sort of lump all those dots together, you start to get clusters of dots. And so what I've done here is, is done that, and these clusters are show up as red dots. And I've then basically just encompassed them with a line just for convenience, just to give you a sense of where those dots are, because dots get a bit irritating to look at. So you can see where the red locations are where rare and endangered species occur. The blue locations are also rare and endangered species, but these things are sort of falling outside of these major clusters of things. It's not doesn't mean that they're not important and we don't really need to pay attention to them anymore, but it's just saying that they aren't occupying a large landscape that we can try and deal with as a landscape issue. Um, if you do the same thing on Maui, for instance, you get these biodiversity areas that sort of fall out, three major areas. Um, again, one associated with Haleakala National Park. And those are the major, and these areas often are associated with the, with the remaining native forest systems that occur on the islands as well. Um, Lanai, basically Lanai Hale tends to be the dominant area where you see lots of rare native things still showing up. On Molokai, uh, again, it's, uh, there's actually two locations. Molokai has some very unique coastal um, communities that still seem to be fairly intact and, and, uh, and, are, and are well worth uh, a focus for, to, to, for conservation. Um, but again, you know, the high elevation forest areas tend to be the areas you know, where, where native stuff is left and so where you're finding lots of native things still. And of course, Oahu. Uh, <laughs> A lot of endangered plants occur on Oahu, um, occur throughout the Waianae Range as well as in the coastal, in the, in the Ko'olau Range as well. Again, with some, some interesting coastal communities still hanging on that, uh, that are, are worthy of attention. And Kauai is another big area where we have extensive uh, areas that uh, occupy lots of native habitat. Um, again, there's a, there's a really unique cave system down here in the Kaloa lava tube system on Kauai. It's very unusual to find lava tube systems on these older islands because they usually silt in. But uh, Kauai had a late stage eruption that occurred on it, uh, I think about 150,000 years ago that formed uh, a unique lava tube system in this area that has some very unique uh, uh, cave invertebrates that live within that lava tube system. But again, you can see these large areas where biodiversity still remains fairly strong. Of course, lots and lots and lots of observations of rare plants and animals that fall without, outside that area, but are hard to begin to sort of assemble together. Well, <clears throat> the next issue, of course, is once you identify these landscapes, who do you need to go to to talk to about the conservation of those landscapes? Who owns that? who owns the land, basically. It's a major important question. And there are sort of, a, there's a few major landowners in, in Hawaii. The state, of course, is a large landowner. They own quite extensive pieces of land. The Department of Hawaiian Homelands has some fairly large tracts of land. Um, county lands tend to be very small, not very, very much county land is held by the counties. Um, private landowners own very large tracts of land and of course the federal government in some cases has large areas and on some islands and almost nothing on other islands. So on the big island, for, for instance, pardon? Which color represents which? The green here is private land, the green areas. The blue is state land. The yellow is Department of Hawaiian Homelands and the gold here is federal land. So this is of course Volcano National Park that occurs up through here. The red lines that I put on here are the biodiversity areas that I just sort of showed you how we formulated those. And you can see that uh, there's a lot of state land that covers these biodiversity areas, a good hunk of federal land in some cases. And in some cases, private land is a, is a major component. So there's lots of opportunities for 
everybody to get involved in these conservation efforts. Um, you know, it's in some cases there's mandates to do so, like with the with the national park system. In other cases, private landowners have a lot of options in what they want to do in terms of conservation. It's they're pretty much uh, free to pursue whatever activities they think is best for their for their own lands. <coughs> um, I'm just going to show you Kauai. It uh, is a similar sort of situation, again, where you have the state owning large, extensive tracts of land that fall within these biodiversity landscapes, but a good deal of private land as well that, uh, that could contribute to the conservation of it. Hawaiian homelands, the yellow here, not too much that uh, really embraces a lot of the biodiversity of the islands. Well, what's being done to date, of course, is a whole other uh, issue. In this particular map, I have the, the blue hatched areas here on the island of Kauai represent land that uh, is basically potentially available for conservation. It, there, it's in a state land that, the, that state agencies could, could mandate activities on for conservation. Um, the gold areas here show where actually where active conservation is taking place. And you can see there's really not much going on on the island of Kauai. There's just a few spots where there's some, some amount of active management taking place um, for, for native biodiversity, but not a whole lot of, of, of activity actually going on. So there's a, you know, there's a lot that can be done still. There's a lot that still needs to be done if we want to hang on to these, these areas. On the big island, the picture looks a little bit better. Um, this is the island of Hawaii. Again, the black areas um, represent areas that potentially could be used for conservation. And these sort of purple hatched areas represent areas where active management is currently going on. Um, something is actively being done. For instance, this area up on Mauna Kea is where they've recently gone in and tried to remove the remaining uh, go, uh, re remaining sheep that occurred up on the area that were feeding on, uh, you know, keeping a lot of the seedlings of the mamani from germinating and growing up. And, of course, the mamani is what the, the palila bird up there requ requires as a major food source. So, you know, the, the hope is, is that by removing sheep, it will encourage mamani to regenerate, and that will help support the uh, native bird populations that occur on the islands. Of course, the biggest area here is, uh, is Volcano National Park, where you know, they have a mandate to actively manage the, the park for, for the native biodiversity. Um, and there's some other unique areas like uh, uh, Hakalau Forest Reserve, which is a fish and wildlife reserve that's, meant, that's being managed to protect native bird species. And, uh, and Ala'a Kilauea, um, which is a project that's going on to uh, help re rebuild that forest system in that area. Um, sort of finally, I just briefly want to talk about some of the one, you know, so there's lots of issues that come up in, when, when you start talking about conserving land. You know, what's, what is the land there for? What is it to be used for? And how do you set priorities in determining what that land is to be used for? Well, it's a controversial issue, obviously, and, uh, and the state has tried to deal with it in, in several ways. Um, let me just give you an idea of some of the complications that arise here just in terms of, of zoning. These, these purple areas that uh, I've outlined on this, on the Big Island map here represent land that is zoned for protection, conservations, the conservation sub, sub zone that's called protected. And, it's, and, and that conservation sub zone is there to protect the uh, um, the, the natural resources that occur in it. It's a, a subzone that is there to protect valuable resources in designated areas that are necessary for preserving or protecting watersheds, sites of unique archaeological, historic, or geological significance, and natural ecosystems of native plants, fish, and wildlife, especially those that are endangered. So the state has recognized the need for land areas, lands, large landscape areas, to protect these ecosystems and have designated them. Um, the black areas on this map represent areas that are, that are designated for game hunting activities, game mammal hunting, um, to support the recreational and, and, sus and, sus and, 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 sus and sustained yield for, for hunting for, for, for the people on, on the Big Island. Um, the gold areas 
represent areas where the, the conser protected conservation subzone and the game animal hunting areas overlap. So they represent sort of a, a, a potential conflict in, in usage of the land. Um, game mammals tend to be very harmful to the native plants and animals of Hawaii. The plants and animals never evolved in the presence of large ungulates, pigs, goats, deer, and sheep, and they don't handle the disturbances that those animals produce at all. They suffer very badly from it. So, the, so you run into these problems then. How do we balance the conservation needs of Hawaii protecting its native endangered species with the resource needs that Hawaii has. In this, in this particular example, the game hunting activities that people want to pursue. It's a difficult issue and, uh, and one that there's no simple solution for, but it's an issue that needs to be addressed and, uh, and, and needs active participation, not just on the part of conservationists and hunt and, and pig hunters or, or game or, or, sh or sheep hunters, but it needs to be addressed within the context of the communities too. What are the expectations and goals of Hawaii's communities, the people of, in, that live in and around these areas and view these, these natural resources as part of their own natural heritage as well? What do they want to see Hawaii look like 50 years from now or 100 years from now? Are we going to see continual in movement of alien species up into these areas? Or are we really going to try and, and, and stop this process and, uh, and come to grips with a very complicated issue that, that extends beyond biology, beyond ecology, and gets into the, into the, into the social and ethical issues that, uh, that uh, Hawaii needs to really begin to address as a society? That's pretty much, I think, uh, it's going to conclude my talk. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Steve, for a very uh, excellent overview of uh, our uh, <clears throat> biological uh, overview of our Hawaiian natural resources. And uh, I think your presentation uh, gives a pretty good uh, uh, overview of what we've been uh, talking about the entire <laughs> semester. And so uh, we come to the portion of the class where those of you in the viewing audience and of course those of you here in the studio uh, can call in and ask questions of our guest speaker. Uh, this evening we have with us uh, Dr. Stephen uh, Miller. He's with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and he's a program director for uh, ecosystem conservation uh, program within the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service here in the state of Hawaii. And of course, he gave a, an excellent overview of what we've been talking about the entire uh, semester. And so if you have any questions uh, for Steve, uh, please give us a call. We are coming to you live this evening from the television studios located in the Mookini Library here on the University of Hawaii at Hilo uh, campus. And the numbers are 974-7726. 9747727 and of course those of you on the outer islands you can call us uh, direct at or collect at 9619046 and uh, I understand we do have a caller so will the first caller uh, let us know where you're calling from and go ahead with the question for Steve Yes, uh, I'm calling from uh, Kailua Kona. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed the program. Thank and you. I wanted to ask uh, about what we can do um, as citizens to put some peace into the laws to keep out alien species from our islands. For example, I just went on a garden tour sponsored by the Outdoor Circle here. and. We toured someone's garden that had introduced a lot of alien species, and it was, you know, very upsetting to me. And I, I want to know what, what is it that we can do, maybe, to encourage legislators uh, to, to help with this problem. Okay. Well, first of all, we do have uh, safeguards, and as you are well aware, uh, when you come into the state of Hawaii via the airplane, you, you fill out that. Uh, uh, form by the uh, State Department of Agriculture asking if anyone's bringing in uh, any kind of uh, plant life or 
uh, animal life and of course uh, our quarantine system not only the federal uh, plant quarantine uh, program is here to try to prevent alien species from coming in we have the federal uh, plant inspectors of the uh, APHIS animal ha health plant inspection service uh, at the airports always uh, checking your baggage to make sure that uh, uh, you don't send foreign uh, uh, plants and atoms to to California and at the same time we or uh, to other portions of the United States and at the same time we want to prevent uh, wildlife or, or other alien species from coming into the state um, so there are our laws and it's, it's just a matter of kind of educating uh, the people not to bring in uh, a lot of these alien species because they can become uh, pests in Hawaii because a lot of times, uh, for example, some insects that come in, uh, they can become very uh, harmful uh, pests. And what happens, they come into the, uh, uh, the islands without their native complement of parasites and predators. And, and this uh, causes a population explosion and uh, these insects can cause terrible damage to our uh, crops or our native uh, biota. Uh, so the quarantine system is, is a way to uh, prevent the introduction of alien species. Maybe, uh, Steve, uh, you might be able to comment some more on this. Uh, I'll turn over the, uh, the microphone to Steve. So Steve, maybe you can say a few words also. Yeah, I, th I think that's. I think what you said, Jack, uh, is really excellent. Um, you know, the alien species problem, of course, is is a is one of the really big problems that drives conservation in Hawaii, and we really, you know, need to to begin to take this seriously. And I think education, um, you know, awareness by the general public is is a major major aspect of that. Um, you know, we need to put together major outreach programs that begin to you know, go around to the Hawaiian communities and really make them aware of the of, of how these alien species affect you know the native plants and animals and uh, and let them know that uh, that you know that they, they really have to be careful with with what they what they bring in and how they treat it when the, when they you know put it out in their yards or in their gardens or wherever it happens to be so I think I think outreach is a, is, a, is a large component that really needs to be expanded greatly on the part of the state and the federal government and and the, and the local communities as well the local botanical gardens as well um, there's lots of beautiful things in the world and, and we'd all would love to have them here in Hawaii lots of plants and animals that are really quite spectacular but uh, but there's lots of beautiful native things here in Hawaii that are equally worth uh, propagating and, 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 and putting out that uh, I think would provide us with an equal amount of joy and satisfaction. Okay, well, thank you very much for those comments, uh, Steve, and uh, thank you for the caller from Kona. I believe we don't have any callers at the present time. Do we have any questions from the classroom? Uh, if not, uh, I'd like to remind uh, all of you that uh, if I may have the Elmo, uh, let me zoom in on this. Uh, I just want to remind you that this is the last session of uh, Focus on Agriculture. And I'd like to remind all of you that uh, your lecture notes are due in my office on Thursday, May 13th. And uh, for those of you who are taking the course uh, on television, uh, I'll put my address uh, here for you. Uh, College of Agriculture, Forestry, and Natural Resource Management, or CAFNARM, uh, University of Hawaii, Hilo, 200 West Kawili Street, Hilo, Hawaii, 96720-4091. And I believe we sent out the evaluation forms uh, uh, earlier this week, so you should be getting those soon in the mail. And we'd appreciate if you would fill out the evaluation form and submit them with your uh, lecture notes. <clears throat> we do have two callers, so will the uh, first caller let us know where you're calling from and go ahead with your question, please. Aloha. Aloha. Um, Dr. Fuji? Yes. Yeah, thank you for giving me the opportunity. And aloha to uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Miller. Okay. Uh, I'm calling from Hilo. Okay. Um, you know, I, what I've seen so far, you know, is a good picture of um, what the plans of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife as well as the DLNR, our state DLNR, 
uh, and the rest of the environmentalists, namely the Sierra Club, the Earth Justice uh, uh, Program uh, Club, uh, as well as um, uh, Nature Conservancy's uh, efforts, to just take a hold and take control of everything that we have on this island. You know, I, I tell you the honest to goodness truth, okay, from the, when we go up hunting up in the various parts of the mountain, like say for instance Kulani mm -hmm. or Pu Puumaka'ala areas, certain areas because of the NARS Commission, okay, the National Area Reserve, right. have fenced up various areas, okay. I mean, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of acres, okay, of land up in the Pohakaloa area, mm -hmm. the Kipukas, um, various parts, uh, uh, at uh, Manuka and also, uh, uh, like I said, up and down uh, Pumakala, which is in the Kulani area. And the thing about it is, you don't know how much destruction that this type of fencing actually does to the environment. You know when they actually go in and put in one strand of pick uh, what do you call, hog wire fence mm -hmm. in, they have to clear at least 15 feet. We have videos and pictures okay, of, of big hapus, 10 feet tall, being chopped down, okay, and used as stepways, okay, and also huge core logs just being left there to rot, not being used by the public. And when you go into this forest there is the first thing you see is the regeneration of not only alien, uh, what do you call, um, uh, indig indig indigenous uh, uh, or Hawaiian species uh, mm -hmm. type plants, major species plants, but you also see a generation of weeds coming in. I'm talking about alien species weeds. Now, alien species that never existed in the forest before has now been introduced by man because mm -hmm. of these fencing. And we're talking about thousands of acres being fenced up. You know, uh, I belong to the pig hunters of Hawaii, okay? And we believe in small area containment fencing. Mm -hmm. We really do like certain areas uh, uh, below Army Road or in the Kul uh, Kulani area, okay? 200 acres, which we feel that is pristine areas. But you know, uh, not another thing what we do believe in is small containment areas, not large parcels of land being taken away from the public for their own personal use, whether it be for hunting or gathering. You know, it's really absurd that the envi environmentalists as well as you know, uh, the federal government and the state government come in and eradicate all these animals. These animals, if, if you actually look at the most pristine areas on this island, as far as the forest areas, you'll find that the majority of the birds, the alien, uh, the um, what do you call indigenous species, mm -hmm. uh, Hawaiian native uh, birds, are all there within their own established ecosystem with the rest of the sheep, the goats, the pigs, the wild cattle, they're all there. And you kind of wonder why the federal government considers these areas pristine areas and try to eradicate something that's already working, a working system that's mm -hmm. been established for over 300 years since the introduction of these game animals. Uh, okay, and so... And try to it. So that doesn't make sense to me. What, what would you propose? <clears throat> well, one of the things I do propose is management as far as control. Mm -hmm. You need to control. Look at, look at uh, say for instance, up in Mauna Kea. Mm -hmm. They eradicated the sheep about 20 years ago, almost 30 years now, okay? Total eradication, 10,000 sheep. We feel that some of the sheep population could have come down to about a manageable area, a uh, count of about 2,500, 2,000 sheep up there, okay? Taking care of the grass areas. If you were to go up there in Mauna Kea right now, what you would see is a huge mess of gorse. Yes. It's this sticky plant, okay? Right. This plant has got thorns. It's worse than Kiavi. Mm -hmm. You can't go through it, right. okay? They stand about 10 to 15 feet in height, and they can't get rid of it. And nobody wants to take responsibility of that gorse. Now, that gorse is making its way down into the Wailuku River and also... It's, in fact, it's down here already, up, up and down the Wailuku River. In fact, there's a plant on Maui's canoe right now that's established itself. You know, how much more, uh, who's going to take responsibility for all of this? We're talking about thousands and thousands of acres. What we need to do is put back some of these animals so that, and, and 
clear whatever gorse that's, it, that's up there and stuff like that, and leave the animals in there to manage the soil. The pigs go in there, they till the soil. You know, there's a lot of indigenous plants that have come up, especially koa, especially uh, the mamani, uh, you know, the nayo, uh, and various other plants that have come up because of the regeneration of the soil, the tilling of the soil that the pigs do, mm -hmm. you see. And, you know, we need to have control. That's the most important thing, control. That's a key word, not removal and not eradication. Well, I In think, fact, I next think month, also uh, this month, on the 17th and 18th, is scheduled for another eradication of sheep on the Kaohi and as well as the Mauna Kea area. Last uh, November, they took out 181 sheep, killed them, and left it there to rot. The only, they only brought out 30 and gave it to the hunters, you know. And there was a lot of hunters well, over there hoping to get some meat. Okay, I think, I think uh, you know, as uh, Dr. Miller was stating earlier, uh, there has to be some kind of balance. And, of course, uh, uh, it's a very controversial issue. There, there are hunters, there are uh, conservationists, and we have to strike some kind of a balance. And uh, I think uh, Dr. Miller was alluding to that, and, and maybe uh, I'll, I'll pass the buck to uh, uh, Dr. Miller and see what he has to say a little bit about this uh, situation. We do have another caller, so I'd like to take that caller. So I'm going to have Steve say a few words about it. Yeah, I, I, I agree with him completely in that control is the issue. Um, how, do we, how do we really begin to manage these lands? And what is the management objective that we want to have for these lands? Um, that is really an essential issue that needs to be addressed. Um, I, I want to dissuade anybody from thinking that the Fish and Wildlife Service has some grand plan or scheme is, or has worked out all this um, in, in terms of wh what to do and where to do it. That simply isn't, isn't true at all. Quite the, quite the opposite, as a matter of fact. The Fish and Wildlife Service has no coherent plan or policy with regard to these issues. Um, um, it's not in the position of doing that. Um, the, the, the issues are, need to be decided by all of the players involved, the hunters, the conservationists, the people of the communities of Hawaii, the private landowners that, that, that may or may not wish to participate in these activities. Where we are at right now in Hawaii is that we need to begin to come up with a way to bring all these people together and begin to make some substantial decisions about how to manage these lands and what our expectations are for the future of Hawaii. As I say, we need to decide what we want Hawaii to be 50 years from now or 100 years from now and begin working toward that now. If it's to have open hunting areas, then that's a societal decision that can happen, absolutely. If it's to have conservation areas, that's a decision that society needs to make as well. But we have to begin to come up with a method, a mechanism, a forum in which those decisions can, issues can be addressed and discussed and decisions can be reached so that we can begin to move into management areas and really begin to deal with these conservation issues in a major way. Okay, well, thank you very much for calling from Hilo and uh, uh, I guess we just have to take your, your words under advisement uh, at this time. And so what we'll do is we'll take the next caller. Uh, will the next caller uh, let us know where you're calling from and uh, go ahead with your question, please. Hi, I'm calling from Hilo. Okay. And I have a couple of comments and a couple of questions. All uh, right. One, I've been watching the show throughout the semester, mm -hmm. and it has been wonderful, and this has been a great culmination, this program. Um, and do appreciate all of the great information. Um, one thing that I have noticed throughout the programs, it seems to pop up that so many people that are involved in trying to protect and monitor our creatures on our islands and plants, um, can it, the innuendo, if it hasn't been directly stated, is that manpower to monitor, to do head counts. I heard it tonight with the listing of candidates that may go on to endangered species and the understanding our federal government's always cutting back. Um, is there a way or has there been an idea to incorporate some of those nonprofit groups in getting out, making some counts, and getting some of those candidates on our you know, proposed list, but starting to move towards protection? Um, that is one question. 
And then I did was listening to the previous caller, mm -hmm. um, and I had had the opportunity to get up to the volcano to the biological control center, and I believe that they are working on a biological control for the gorse. So that they that, are. Um, has been recognized as a horrible problem, and whether they've really come to terms with it and found something, I don't recall at this juncture, but that um, just to put the man's mind at ease, it's not being ignored. Um, so that's it. <laughs> yes, uh, I, I, the they, uh, State Department of Agriculture has introduced these little weevils. I believe they belong to the genus Apion. And, uh, uh, they haven't been doing a, a fantastic job on keeping the gorse down is it because it's really spreading. And also I think they're looking at various uh, disease uh, organisms that may attack the gorse. So uh, like you said, they are working on it. And maybe I'll have uh, Steve uh, comment uh, on the other aspect. Yeah, uh, as far as um, you know, community involvement, um, there are a number of organizations throughout the state that, uh, that use volunteers for, for lots of activities, Think groups like the Sierra Club or, uh, or the Audubon Society, where volunteers are a major part of the activities of those groups. And they, they in fact, carry out uh, um, um, very useful activities in, in terms of you know, trying to deal with alien species that are getting out into areas, going in and you know, pulling up uh, you know, blackberries and, and along trails and, and things like that, which in, in fact are very, very valuable activities and get the, help get the general public involved in the, in, in the issues. Um, I, th I think there needs to be more done, obviously. As I say, the, the outreach aspect of, of, of Hawaii's, of, un, of getting the public to understand the current situation in Hawaii and, and, and what, uh, you know, people think need to be done to try and, and, and stem the tide is a, is a very important issue. And uh, uh, I, I'm somewat redundant here, and as I keep coming back to this theme of needing to get community involvement in an organized, coherent fashion where, th where the opinions and objectives of, of the citizens of the state can really be, be made, you know, clearly expressed and, and brought to bear on this problem. Okay, uh, while we're uh, waiting for uh, other callers, I I'd just like to say a few words of thanks to uh, the UH Manoa uh, HITS people out there. Uh, we have Roy Liu, who is in charge over there in Honolulu. We had about eight sessions of our Focus on Agriculture classes coming from the uh, television studios located in the Kaikendal Hall second floor on the UH Manoa campus, and I'd like to really thank all the crew over there for uh, assisting us in uh, getting our focus on agriculture class uh, through this semester and uh, especially to uh, again Roy Liu for helping us out and of course uh, this evening we are coming to you live from uh, Hilo here uh, UH Hilo campus and uh, we have with us Dr. Steve Miller and we're talking about uh, uh, a biological overview of our natural resources and uh, Dr. Miller just kind of gave a, a capstone overview of what we've been talking about the entire semester. We hope that uh, we were able to let you know about our in, uh, environment here in Hawaii uh, with all our native uh, endangered uh, flora and fauna. And uh, so I, just so long as you found out through Focus and Ag this semester that uh, we do have a lot of endangered species and uh, we have a unique uh, ecosystem here in Hawaii. Uh, we also respect the uh, hunters and, and everything. And as Steve had indicated, we have to kind of get together and uh, uh, find a point where we can all uh, live together and work together uh, in this state and because Hawaii is an island situation, uh, land is very precious and uh, uh, of course we cannot afford to have a lot of these alien species coming in and, and taking over uh, our unique uh, ecosystem. And uh, I guess we have about one minute uh, to go. Uh, I just want to remind you that the lecture notes are due on the 13th, uh, next Thursday. We sent out the um, evaluation forms. We hope that uh, you'll fill the evaluation forms out and uh, send them in with your uh, notes. Uh, as I said again, you don't have to rewrite your notes. Your handwritten notes are fine for me. Uh, and so 
Uh, again, I'd like to thank you for uh, watching Focus on Agriculture this uh, past semester. It was a pleasure uh, presenting the class to you. We hope that you'll join us next fall when we'll have a cooking class. So this is Jack Fujii saying thank you very much for watching and good evening.